So welcome everybody. Thank you to those who've joined us um, and thank you especially to our speakers today who are going to introduce themselves in a moment. Um, this is the last one in our series of community discussions about um, different ways that maker spaces can um, build business models and, and financial sustainability and some of the different activities that they can do. So today we're focusing on supporting startups. Um, we've got two excellent speakers with us today. We've got Renee Parker from R Labs and Eric Yong from Zytec Investment Office. So um, if I could come to you first, please, Renee, and just ask you to give um, a brief introduction to yourself, to what you do at R Labs, um, and to your interest in supporting startups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lene Parker. I'm currently sitting in Cape Town, which is the southern tip of Africa. Um, we're enjoying summer, so I'm quite happy at the moment. So for our labs, there's three things that we do. The first thing is we build people. People then build businesses, and then we come in and we help them scale their businesses. We've been around since 2009. Um, we've had activities in 23, 23 countries, trained over 100,000 people, impacted 2 million people throughout the various technologies, supported businesses. And I think one of our proudest moments or our proudest initiatives is when the businesses we support are able to create livelihoods for other people. So we're very intentional in when we're supporting startups and we're supporting businesses that their intention is to actually create jobs because we know that that's one of the big things that's missing and um, that we're lacking on our continent. So that's a little bit about me and what I do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rene. And um, I was had the privilege of visiting our labs um, when we had a, a Make Consortium meeting in Cape Town last year, and it was really inspiring to see the um, the space, although I believe you've got a new space since then, but to, and, and to meet some of the people, um, some of the entrepreneurs who you've been working with. So. Um, yeah, very excited to have you with us today. Thank you. So, Eric, if I could come to you now, please, and ask you to just give us a, a quick introduction to yourself um, and to your work. Um, thank you. Hi, yes. Sorry, I'm expecting this. Yeah, but... yeah, perfect. So, uh... different Eric, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I think it's the right Eric now. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Eric Young. I'm CEO of Zytec Investment Office. Uh, my background is in venture building. Uh, before uh, being CEO at uh, Zytec, have been for a decade CEO of GreenTech Capital. Um, we were uh, focusing on supporting and investing in uh, African startup um, with. Uh, Green tech, I think that uh, so we've supported more than a thousand uh, startups through helping them with uh, capacity building. And with green tech, we have implemented uh, with green tech, we have implemented um, um, eight years, nine years ago, the result for equity where we were providing venture building support to investors to help them from early stage to grow stage. Um, I'm very passionate about uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I'm committed to help African entrepreneurs develop the more companies, and that's why I've, I've moved into that area. Um, last year, um, Green Tech has stopped his investment activity, and then we've moved those investment activities into Zytec Investment Office, which is located in the U.S., and uh, we continue to support entrepreneurs, but we have a focus on the governance and the transparency in terms of data in order to allow them to have access to more capital and uh, also to uh, build more collaboration with other stakeholders. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. And we're very happy to have you with us today. Um, I should have said this at the start because I do see some some names and faces that I'm not sure I recognize from um, previous conversations. So just to say a little bit about how this works, um, it's intended to be very much a discussion. Um, so, you know, I will moderate. I will. Um, I have some questions that I want to ask um, both of our speakers. 
but we also really encourage any of you um, in the audience to participate too, either with questions or by sharing your own experience, you know, telling us about the work that you do. Um, so if you'd like to do that, please um, feel free to type things in the chat um, or, or put a hand up um, and uh, we'll, we'll come around to you. So thank you very much. So Rene, if I could come back to you now um, and ask you to tell us a little bit about, like, could you just maybe tell us a couple of stories of some of the entrepreneurs that you've worked with and the types of businesses that they've built with your support? Um, I'm, I'm only pausing because I'm thinking which ones should I should I start with? Um, so some of the, the businesses vary. We do small businesses, medium businesses. Most of them are livelihood businesses. And then because of the work that we do at our labs, it's really on the grassroots. So it would be an individual, an entrepreneur that's starting out. And they're really just doing business because they want to support their families. And that is okay. extremely basic. So they're buying or selling goods or services that they're rendering. rendering. So when they come to our labs and they come, um, they join our incubation program, or they're just joining any of our training, we look at how do we help them scale their business? So of course we want them to grow. We don't just want them to, to stay a small business. We want them to grow. And because we have, Part of our labs, we have an innovation lab that focuses on innovation and technology. So we're able to take them through a sandboxing process. We're able to take them through a process where if they've never thought of technology in their business before, it gives them a moment to explore. Because for many businesses, you know, when you ask them, are you a tech business or are you thinking about technology or are you, are you being innovative? They never think they are. But when you actually have a conversation with an entrepreneur, you can actually hear like this person is actually being innovative, especially during COVID, when the way you ran your business before, everyone had to change. If you wanted to stay around, you had to pivot, you had to be agile. It was um, it was imperative, right? Yeah. And so we've seen that businesses can adjust to the environment, to the market, to what is happening in the immediate um, surroundings. They just don't know the words to use, you know, so they wouldn't use innovation and they wouldn't use all these other words. They just don't understand the language. So when they come into our labs and we, we look at exploring all these things, we use design thinking. Um, sometimes we actually have to do a co-creation with them just to, to, you know, to get them thinking and get other players in the room to help them. And we actually see, you know, that there's this light bulb moment that happens and they're like, wow, my business can actually make an impact. Um, I can actually get eight jobs and I can scale it. So, you know, and I mean, this is just generally what we do with the business. Of course, we have technology businesses that come to us as well, and they might be more matured. So they're already established. They might have a bit of tech that's already, um, you know, that, that underlies the, the business. But they, they don't really think of scaling, maybe, or they're looking for partners or they're looking for investors. And one of the things that we realize, especially with the entrepreneurs that we're working with, you know, for an entrepreneur, when you're looking for, for capital or for investment, you generally go to your friends and your family first, right? That's, that's the first place you go and look for funding. But for many of our entrepreneurs, friends and family don't have money <laughs> to give you, right? Um, and so for them being part of our labs, we become that for them. We become the friends and family um, circle. And so it means for us, we actually, in, most of the time, we are the first investors in their businesses, small amounts, but at least, you know, it's something to show that, you know, this, this business actually works. So it ranges from the livelihood businesses, which could be somebody that's just baking or sewing or somebody that's doing carpentry. And it could be to health tech or somebody working with AI. So the range is it's, it's quite big. And we found like, you know, this place for everyone because everyone is at a different um, place in the business. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and yeah, the the way that you take a position as an early investor, I, I think is particularly interesting. And I'd like to come back to that um, a little bit later on if we can. Um, but but for um, now, I'd like to turn to Eric and ask you if you could just tell us a little bit about um, some examples or, or categories. What are the types of businesses that you work with? What type of stage are they at? That kind of thing. 
Um, so um, in the last years, we've been working mostly with um, early stage uh, startups. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, for example, with a startup developing platform to address the challenge in the value chain in agriculture. Um, I know that was kind of a, a, a strong topic. And what we've tried to do is ident identify a um, great founder who wanted to target the big market and basically uh, improve the environment so that then uh, the whole system could create more values. And I'm, I'm thinking about one example that um, that explains a little bit of the part of the venture building, because there's a part of the venture building, the uh, pre, I would say pre-investment, and then there's a part post-investment. So in the part of the venture building, it was really to help them put in place the the mechanic of the business model. So if I take the example of that platform, when we met them, the, what they were doing was to uh, uh, find relay on the ground to aggregate the collections of, of uh, product from smaller farmers and sell them to all sellers. Um, there's been a work of, uh, there's, a, there's a collaboration with different experts that would make uh, available. And at the end, uh, so they did it for, uh, I think, like one or two years. At some point, what we've seen is that because they were starting to have a lot of information, a lot of data, that they they could not really scale if they did not have more uh, working capital because they need to buy more input. They need to to uh, be involved in more transactions. And even if we find some solutions beyond the capital, there was some other needs. And then at some point, uh, looking at stepping back and looking at the business, what we realize is that they have collected information in terms of the capacity of production of the smaller farmers uh, would let them to finally, finan finally develop a, a, a credit scoring uh, solutions where they could basically say, okay, the probability for these farmers to pay back is X. And at the end, they move from having wholesalers are the client, they move to have bank as a client that allow them to scale. So basically what we're looking at in the venture building is look at the structure of the business, see how the business can scale, how the business can be sustainable and looking at how, what change they create in their environment so that they, we can implement a, a better model to make it more system, sustainable and scale the business. That's an example of what we're doing, um, what we did and what we're still doing with green tech at pre-investment with a venture building. And then when it comes to post-investment, that's where actually Zytec is coming, where we support them in structuring their governance by helping them with the portfolio management. So we collect their, their data every month. Uh, we look at how they're performing. When they have challenges, we send them some uh, experts and we structure reporting that they can provide to the investors. So like this, we make we make sure that the information is captured and ready when they want to be to to fundraise. So that those are the the kind of things that we're doing, and with an example of what we did um, in Ghana uh, in agriculture, and okay. basically uh, we covered we we had a thesis where we looked at essentials and platform. So essential were like um, agriculture, uh, like food, educations water that we will be looking at and platform where all the technology that we use to address the frictions in value chains where you use uh, so you can have fintech you have health tech etc cetera, etc cetera. so those were, those were the two pillars that we we followed and uh from a country perspective we start initially with anglophone countries with the major countries uh, nigeria kenya south africa um egypt uh, but we also moved um, to the Francophone countries that were most, um, where you have Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we, we, we made an investment uh, recently in Benin, in the health sectors. So, yeah, so we are kind of agnostic when it comes to um, sectors and, and region. Okay. And how do you find the companies that you work with? I mean, uh, and, and like... Are they in any particular networks already? Or, or I'm, I guess I'm curious about what kind of support structures they typically have around them. So uh, uh, I think I went there early stage. 
I think that we have to see the difference between um, eight years ago and now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think eight years ago, the ecosystem of uh, accelerator incubator was not so much mature in Africa, and there were not so much expertise, I would say, in those networks. I think that now, with all the work that have been done by the development agency, all the founders that have been through, now there's much more experience, I think, in the different uh, incubator and accelerators. So um, I think that there is, uh, and also because there's more and more program uh, that have been learning from the past, I think the, the, the resources that they have are more, they have more experience. They have, uh, they can uh, discuss with other founders who already been successful or failed, what was not possible uh, before. And uh, I think that you have, for example, environment like the one that make that you, you are having. So you have different kind of environment that bring different kind of kind of uh, um, kind of services. So uh, personally, even though uh, we are supporting for the access of capital, I'm from the old school where I believe that you need first to create value by yourself. You don't need to look for capital. You, if you look for capital and you use capital to create your values. In reality, you don't have values because somebody else can actually use the same capital and make the same values. So um, that's I, I think that this the 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 environment is a little bit more favorable because you have people who 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 made that cycle already. Thank you, um, Renee. I saw you smiling when um, when Eric was talking about um, the necessity of, of having the value already without before you get the capital. Um, is that something that, that chimes with your experience too? Yes, I, I definitely love Eric's line about being old school. <laughs> I, I think we all need to go, we, we need to go back to the foundations, right? Because, and I, I, I agree with Eric 100% that if you can't create value without investment, then it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be sustainable because if you can create value without investment, it means that it's something that can sustain, you know, beyond that. And I think a, a lot of time, especially in this new age, we have startups, you know, they, that's purely why they're starting is because of the investment. So their why is completely skewed. And so it means they're not gonna last long or they get the investment and they drop out and they decide they don't wanna do it anymore or they don't use the money to grow the business. I mean, we've seen, we've seen those instances. Um, and if you just think about it, like someone is investing their time and their energy and the resources to make it work, and yet the, the founder themselves are not willing to put in the, the sweat to create the value before yeah. the time. So how do you, our labs, how do you find the right kind of founders? How, you know, how do you find the people who go through your programs? I don't know if we ever find the right kind of founders because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's always, I don't know, sometimes I feel, you know, it's just touch and go, you you have a gut feel. I mean, for, for us, it's really looking at what, what is the, what is, of course, they need to have a business model. They need to have the passion. They need to have the drive because those are things that also keeps you beyond, um, you know, and it helps with sustainability. But for the founders, it's, it's really, I guess it's because of where we're situated, right, and the type of um, entrepreneurs that we're working with. So it's really, the, the person needs to have the wall. You know, they, they need to, the, the, that needs to be there. I mean, the, the specific skill set that they need to actually grow their business or whatever else it is, those things you can bring in. But for the founder themselves, like it must be something that they really want to do. And we even encourage founders and even the entrepreneurs and some of them get really stuck on this one idea and sometimes, you know, they come to us and I just think, oh, this is really not going to work, you know, but you see, they're so invested and dedicated to it. But if you have a founder that's prepared to understand, okay, I'm getting into this, I want to add value, I'm creating value, but I also want to, it needs to be more than that. And so they prepare to grow, they prepare to listen, they prepare to, to take advice, and they prepare to take risks. Um, because sometimes our entrepreneurs are also risk averse and they want to play it safe and, and um, you know, stay on the, the side that they know. And of course, that comes in with history and, and uh, you know, what, thing, what, what has happened in past generations. 
Um, so we know that that is definitely one of the fears. It's always like, you know what, if this does not work, there are so many people counting on me. There's so many people depending on me that it's not just a failure for me as a founder. It's, you know, the ripple effect on my family and my community is larger than that. So for us, you know, if the, the founder just needs to be dedicated, they must just be willing to, to take the risk with us because that's what we do. We walk alongside them and it's not like we're just pushing you aside. And especially when it comes to invest, that's why the being the first investor in the businesses are so important to us because it's a way for us to show, you know what, we're in this with you. And so again, you know, some sometimes it works and sometimes it actually doesn't work. But you know, we we're hoping that it gets better over time. Absolutely. Um, and I was struck when you um, when you were giving your introduction about and um, when you said what R Labs does and you said I may got the wording wrong, but you essentially said that the first thing you do is building people um, and, you know, and, and that the building businesses comes afterwards. So I think that that also um, that, you know, that struck me. And I think that speaks to the the importance of the, the founders, um, which is also something I've um uh, come across in in other situations um when i was based in ghana um i was able to visit mest which is an organization that sort of um gathers um i guess potential founders from across um africa and, and puts them through a program and kind of assembles teams of, of entrepreneurs from that um eric i'd be interested in your perspective on this point i mean i'm, I'm guessing that um you are looking for um in your work for situations where you've got the right founders and the right idea already working on something together. Um, is that fair to say, or are there are there times when you think one is more important than the other? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't hear you at the moment, Eric. Sorry, I hear you at the moment. Uh, uh, I said that. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah. So uh, it's an interesting point because I had this conversation not long ago with a good friend of mine, and we were talking about uh, what's the most important: the founder of the business. And then we finally agree that you know, like it's seventy thirty. So seventy percent is the founder, thirty percent is the business or the idea, because we know that the business is going to change some of the assumptions that the founder has at the beginning will be confronted to the reality and that that will bring him to take another direction. So what what you want to find is a founder that will be able to deal with failure, that will be able to uh, learn, and that will be able to 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 um, have, I think that's something something that is pretty important, accountability. Because when it comes to when it comes to Africa, I think that um, we have a, a generation of founder who haven't been uh, really exposed to um, investors, you know, like experienced investors, which are expecting a certain number of. Uh, I'm like they they make available money for you, and depending on what kind of business you're building, they have different expectations. And if you look at most of the companies, so now we're talking about a startup. So the 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 way of growing is to uh, investing, innovate, invest, innovate, invest, etc. So so they always are are uh, running to the next uh, funding round. So which means that for them it's a matter to say, how am I going to create value from this round to the next round, etc., 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 and so that they can show and prove to the investors that they're creating that. Uh, that uh, values. Um, if there was a SME, that would be much more different because it was like it would be more like uh, make sure that the process function that they can replicate and create the generate the value that they are creating and and and, and grow uh, with more with less less aggressively. I will say, uh, and and for this, I think that um, there's a big work. Um, it's very hard to find the right founders because. What, from my point of view, what defines the founders uh, are its values. Because at some point, uh, if you have a founder with the right value, he will make sure that uh, he's going to do the work, he's going to put the hours, 
uh, it will be very concerned about the fact that you gave him a chance and you gave him money and then he has to pay you back based on the condition that he promised. So all those aspects are very important. It's very hard to see that. Uh, and I think that this is where we see the difference between the Francophone and Anglophone culture. Why right? the Franco in the Anglophone uh, culture, the value founder will already fail. So they failed. They know the pain of failure. They know the pain of not paying back to the the the, the investors, and they they, they consider that as a debt. So next time they they would do better. In the Francophone uh, culture, that will be more like if you fail, uh, okay, better you stop. So I think that um, I, I I think that it's really difficult to find the founders. But I will look at his values. I will look at uh, his relationship with family, friends. I will look at his experience with other investors in terms of how did he deal with other investors? Did, was he concerned about uh, them winning or losing money? Because all this are what's going to determine his capacity to take the right decision in his business to the benefit of all the stakeholders involved in his uh, uh, in his activities, so it, it's 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 uh, a um, it's quite challenging, um, and uh, I can understand <laughs> I can understand Rene when he said that you 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 don't really know, uh, but I know personally that for all the companies that I've been building, most of the time people have. They told me, okay, we bet on you rather than on the business, because at the, at the end, uh, you are you you have this debt toward the investors, um, and you are accountable. So that's that's my perspective on the topic. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Thank you, um, Rene. I'd be interested um, in your reflections on Eric's point about um, founders not. Uh, not being very familiar with the expectations of investors, um, not having had much exposure um, to them in the past, and whether that's something that you've noticed, and, and in, also whether you've seen a change over time in that kind of thing. I mean, I think that's that's definitely the case, right? And so mm. you don't know what you don't know, right? So you've never received investment before, the circle you're moving in, no one is getting investment. You, you don't know about it, right? And I think it's, we, we at this stage now, we, it's being talked about more. So there are more events, there are more gatherings, there's more, you know, the media is talking more about it. Um, so people are hearing about it. Not everybody really understands what it means to, to get investment, what's my, what's responsibility. When I speak to any entrepreneur, they all, the first thing is always like, I need investment. And when I ask them, okay, for what? You're like, what exactly? And they're like, oh, no, for my business. And I'm like, okay, but what specifically in your business? So for many entrepreneurs, you know, they think that that's the thing that's going to save them. Um, you know, like, I just need money to, I just need money to be invested and everything is going to be great. They're forgetting about the processes and the systems that they need to work on their business model and who's their customers and all the other aspects of the business. So, of course, you know, first prize for everybody is like, oh, no, I just need investment. But when you actually get into what kind of investment or for what, for what is it for specifically, what you're going to use it for? And do you have the necessary mechanisms in place to receive the investment? Because that's another thing that we realize, right? Depending on the investor, depending on what the um, specifications are, some of our businesses are not ready to receive someone else's money. That is you know, it's a sad reality, but it's an actual reality, which means for, for organizations working with entrepreneurs, it means we still have a lot of work to do. You know, it's not just about unlocking investment, but it's actually making sure that our businesses are ready to receive the investment. Because remember when an investor comes in and they give money, and I'm just going to use our as an example, and let's say they come in and, I mean, and we had one of these cases already, very sadly, but they came in and it was one of the art labs businesses. And, you know, we had high hopes for the entrepreneur or for the founder. Um, and, you know, the investor invested in the person because they felt, you know, they came through us and it was one of our connections. But then this founder actually just messed everything up, you know. Um, 
he didn't work well with the money. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. Oh, I'm saying now it's a he, um, but it, it, has, it was a man. But then the investor himself was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to give money to any of your other entrepreneurs. And so again, you know, that's, it just shows that we still have so much work to do because um, as, as Art Labs, as an organization, you know, that works with, with entrepreneurs and the investor, if it comes through you, it's also your reputation on the line. And so when I spoke about the risks earlier on, you know, that's one of the, the, you know, it's one of our realities is that as much as we want our entrepreneurs to get access to capital and access to investment, there's more on the line than just opening a door and giving access, you know, because there are a hundred other entrepreneurs that also needs the access. And so if there's someone and the relationship didn't go well, then, you know, those are things that we have to pick up afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. That actually um, brings me on really nicely to the next, next point I wanted to bring up, which was about um, like for you, as an organization and, and starting with our labs, but um, we'll of course come to Zytec as well. As an organization that works with startups, what is it important for you to get right? Um, and obviously managing the reputational risk um, with investors is, as you've just addressed is one of them, Renee, but um, what else do you think is really important when you're working with startups? When we work with, when we work with the startups, regardless, of how mature the business is, right? Um, we find that there's a lot of work that needs to happen with the individual, with the person. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you're working on two levels. You're working with a person in the business and the processes and all those things, or innovating or you know creating a new um, business model, but then also with the individual themselves. And so we find you know we we have to. We only we don't only work either with with young entrepreneurs or with older older entrepreneurs as in age and maturity, but we work across. And so so some of our and I can't even tell you like oh no it's only after you hit a certain age that you're ready for investment or or not because we've seen it on both spectrums. So we have somebody that's twenty years old or no he's twenty one years old now is an AI business like super smart. But great business model, integrity, like everything you can tick the boxes and all the investors just want to invest in him, right? Um, and then you have somebody else at the same age as him, but a little different because they, they're not as maybe confident or they don't believe in themselves enough. Um, so even when we introduce them to investors, we have to, you know, almost have this pep talk before the time, like, you know your business, you know your stuff, you know what you can do, um, and that's what you need to put forth. So it's really been, a, I would say, a case by case. We can't even say, you know, this is a one size, one size fits all. We've seen that each individual that comes into our program, they are so different. I mean, and I'm just talking about like, you know, a small group of people. And then, you know, just imagine across South Africa and then the continent, like, you know, how many different founders are so different. Um, and so you you can't even just say, you know what, this one program will just work for everybody and will fix everyone. So for us, it's really, you have to look at the individual and what they need are and what they need at, at different points in time. Yeah, I think that's that's such an insightful comment about the different levels at which you have to work with the um, the entrepreneurs and their businesses. Um, Fadia, I see you've got a hand up. Would you like to come in um, before we go to Eric? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious. I have a question for Renee, and I hope I'm not jumping here. Uh, but I, I'm also wondering, what was your decision? Like, um, how did you make the decision to support startups? And why was that important for your space? Because that is not a very familiar path that a lot of makerspaces or spaces in this area take and what does that mean also for you for your sustainability and for your team that's a that's a really good question so it was never part of the plan in the beginning we were literally just building people right and then once people learn a specific skill and they you know and then they were exploring right and so that's when people started 
starting businesses or coming up with ideas and looking at solutions for that. But then we realized, and then what? You know, so it was each time we started something and then the individual was still on the journey with us and and we realized more and more, there's actually no place for them to go to. You know, where do where do I send them after they leave our labs and um, we've helped them with their business? And then of course investment or or getting um, capital was always like, okay, just go to a bank, you know, and get a loan. Um, and most people have bad credit records, so they're not going to get the loan. They don't have an asset that can be shorted, stand, or, or even somebody that can stand surety for them. So getting debt was definitely not one of it. Um, and then we looked at, okay, are there other investors out there that's prepared to invest in them? And it was no, because they 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 don't have the collateral, um, you know, to to be able to receive this money. And that was the key driver for us is that, okay, so we need to become that. And, you know, in the beginning it was, okay, let's, let's explore and let's see. But then we realized that there's a whole layer that's missing when it comes to investment. You know, and so people talk, you know, they talk about that seed, you know, giving seed capital or giving um, early stage investment. But the entrepreneurs we work with are actually a level lower than that. And so that's when we realized, okay, here's a gap and we need to be able to do that. And the only way we could do that because we can't take someone else's money to invest in a business because we're not an investment company. But as our labs, we, uh, we have a non-profit and we have a for-profit. Um, so that's our business model, you know, our sustainability, our non-profit organization owns our for-profit because the for-profit is purely there to make money to support our non-profit, okay? So with our, the work that we do through our consulting services, we create um, apps, some of our innovations that we innovate internally, we end up selling off or we rent it out. So all of this is unrestricted money that comes back into the organization. And with that pool of funds, that's where we can actually invest in the entrepreneurs. And sometimes um, they're not even ready for investment because they still need to validate something or they need to test something. And so you actually need a different, <laughs> you need a different kind of money for that, right? Because you know like, oh, I might not get it back. Or I'm not going to get it back. But if I don't test it now, at this moment in time, we're never going to know. And so for us, it's always about like, we exploring with the, with the entrepreneurs, um, and so getting getting the model right is, I mean, I don't think we have have it right just yet, but we've had to have this two ways. And so for further along businesses, we could we invest in them, we can take equity, or otherwise we do it as as debt, and then they end up paying us paying us back. And we found once they've gone through that, it actually unlocks other funding. Because now it shows that they've received investment, they've worked with it, they managed to grow their business, and now they become um, like more. That is more potential for other investors, you know, to to see the potential in those businesses. I hope that answered your question, Fadia. Cool. Thanks for the question, Fadia, and for the for the response, Renee. Um, Eric, I've I've got two things now that I'd, I'd like to ask you. One is um, for your reflections on. Renee's point about there being a missing tier um, in the investment funding. Um, and um, as well as that, I'd like to ask for your thoughts on um, what is needed to support startups. So you must, in your role, see um, startups that have been through a lot of different accelerators and incubators and, and programs and things like that. And so I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about what the good ones do and um, what it's important for them to get right? Uh, well, <laughs> it's very difficult to say uh, what the good ones or the bad ones are, uh, are doing. I think that uh, for the program, uh, I, I, I see a good program based on the people that are involved in the program and if they have enough experience to be able to help the founder to reflect on his business uh no matter which stage uh, they are because depending on the stage they will have different needs um what i think uh is that uh or at least that's the the approach i'm trying to have 
I think that so we mentioned about the founder and basically when you have a founder, you cannot really transform a founder. Founder is what it is. He has a personality. So I'm mean, like when you pick him, you have to deal with it. But what you can do is you can really help him make sure that his business has the right dynamic. And um, every business, no matter startup or um, or SMEs, they have a sequence that they have to respect. Uh, that they have a sequence of implementation that has to be respect no matter what. And that's one of the first thing that we're trying to look with the founders is, okay, is the sequence how you thought your business is okay? So, uh, and the sequence we see is that we're looking at the vision. Okay, uh, do you understand uh, what where you want to go? Then we're looking at the market and say, okay, are you sure that you have identified really the people who have that problems? Okay, what what uh, and do you know if it's a it's a big problem, it's a small problem because that will define exactly what you're gonna do. And then we we're looking at the clients, and then and then from there, then we're looking at the product. And if you see this, this this is a, a sequence that normally cannot change. And you have some startup, they come with a product. They haven't thought really about the vision. They say, hey, this product is pretty cool. And they say, around this product, I'm going to build something. And that's an issue because, because they haven't not thought through about the other steps, then it, it cannot work. And, you know, so you, are, you, you get the product and then after behind that, you get the team and then you get the process and then you get the technology. But it's really, and if we take any of this sequence, if now you're talking with the 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 entrepreneur and some of the previous sequence doesn't have a clear answers, you you have a a high percentage of chance that what has been focusing on is going to change over time, and it's not the right element, and there are still questions that are not that are not answered, um, and um, and that's and I think that that's something where. Uh, from a structure and dynamic of thinking for the entrepreneurs, uh, we need to try to implement so that he can understand what are the dynamic and how he get to the point of the to the point of the profit. So, um, and when it comes to the question in terms of capital, uh, well, I don't think that the capital is always the solutions. So, mm -hmm. and also there's. There's so many forms of funding that have been developed over the last years. You have the grants, you have the acceleration program, uh, where you either or you get money or you get a space. So you saving money. Uh, you have the engine network that have been also developed um, over the years. So there's different form of capital available. The question for me, it's not so much that there is not enough capital, but it's more that there is not enough transparency of information to allow the capital to reach the founders. Uh, because, uh, and, and also because the founders are not educated in terms of what are the information that are critical for investors to come to, to, come to me and to, 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 to believe in me and to trust in me. Uh, that's one thing. The other things that I see, where I see as being, uh, haven't been a problem uh, the last years, but I think that will be a problem in the year to come, is that you have had this, you know, this uh, early stage investment that I've developed those last years, you know, so engineering investors, grants, et cetera. And with everything that's happening uh, globally, you have a reduction of money allocated to Africa through the development agencies. You have so you have less money. You have less money from the early investors because uh, the allocation for the bigger investors is lower. In uh, they're trying to focus on their main market, and Africa representing only two percent is not their main market. You have the other issue is that the angel investors that invested um, five years ago, eight years ago have not been able to exit, which means that for the moment, uh, I don't see the issue as being like there's not enough capital. I see the issue in the fact that we have not established a clear cycle of investment in Africa 
that bring confidence to investors to say, hey, we're going to put that money here and we'll get out this way. Because the ecosystem in Africa is very different from the model that we're trying to copy, which is the US model. In Africa, you don't have the distributions, you don't have the marketing, and you don't have you don't have the force of distribution, you don't have the force of marketing, and you don't have the heavy capital, which are the, the three elements that allows the European market and more especially the US market to develop so much startup and finance them. And that's and that's why that the model is really based on innovation, financing, around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the context of Africa, I think that we need to find another alternative uh, for growth because paper growth work well in the US, paper growth in Africa is gonna soon become an issue. And in uh, and in Africa now we need to think in terms of how can we grow, develop innovation, develop startup, but in the same time generate um, cash because Africa is, uh, on the only continent where you have real growth because you have real consumers who can actually spend money. Okay, so the approach of the an adult market where you don't have real consumer, where do you have subvention and, you know, they, you can lose money in the US, you'll still get uh, investors. And you can lose money for years and you still get investors. In Africa, that, do, would, that won't work. And that's why I think that um, there are real questions in terms of, uh, what are the cycle of investment we're talking about? Uh, what are the role of the different stakeholders in those cycle of investment? And the cycle can be uh, uh, very short. And um, how can we uh, bring that to, the, to the, the different entrepreneur so that they understand that at some point, they need to be able to generate cash to balance with the risk of the non-closure of the investment cycle that there is. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I, I see that. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat that I'm going to come to in just a moment. But um, first of all, I would just like Rene to ask you um, if you recognize what Eric was saying about the challenges of angel investors getting their money out from the companies um, on a timely timescale. Um, on a, a timely cycle, because I know that um, that's one of your sustainability models is, you know, you're investing in these companies and you want to, at some stage to get it out to put it into other companies. So how does that work with you? Uh, um, it's definitely a little different for, for us because we're going to invest when we know a lot of our, start here, a lot of our startups, the innovations are, are really um, it's a, it's got a huge social impact, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that means through us they can unlock different kinds of funding. So, so we are able to. I mean, maybe not eight years. We, we don't want to wait eight years to get some of our money back. But it means for us, it's, it's really to partner and to bring funders on board that actually does the impact investing. And so, the minute they can unlock that, it means they are able to pay us back. Um, sooner. So for, for us, it's a little different because we only invest in impact um, businesses. So there needs to be a huge, um, yeah, you know, that, that needs to be your, your model is that you're actually solving a real social problem. And at the same time, they are impact investors, that that is what they're looking for. And they actually want to invest in it. I mean, we had two of our, two of our startups, and I think it took us two years to be able to get our our money out that we put in. And of course, we don't put in millions and millions of dollars at smaller amounts. So it's a little different for us than for other angel um, investors that's putting in large amounts of, of money and need to get their money back sooner. Okay, understood, thank you. So looking at the questions in the chat, um, there's a question from Nadate. Um, I don't know if you'd like to unmute and ask this yourself, Nadate, if you're able to. Um, but if you if you aren't, then I will go ahead and um and read it out. Yes, it, I can it, do. Oh, yeah, I can correct. do that. Yes. Uh, no, I was just curious about the cultural differences that, that Eric mentioned. I wanted to know more about that, uh, but also how to control for that. How? Yeah. How? I don't know how they deal with it. Yeah, I'm curious to learn more. 
Um, sorry, to make sure that I understand your question, you're talking about the uh, cultural differences in terms of the approach of financing? The No, you mentioned uh, like uh, founders from different cultures have different responses. Mm -hmm. uh, if in the Anglophone, uh, uh -huh. for instance, in the Anglophone culture, uh, they... Um, they it was something about they would come back and do things versus the francophone culture where if something happens they just uh let it go uh okay okay so so not so okay i understand your question so uh the difference i uh, first of all the difference i see really between uh anglophone and francophone is the approach of entrepreneurship uh, uh francophone they have uh sme like uh, entrepreneurship, meaning that they are very concerned about reaching break even pretty soon, rather than uh, scaling right away. Uh, even even when they are startup, they are really concerned about it because it's cultural. Uh, the 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 investment in equity is something that is that is uh, pretty new um, in the in the environment. And usually, when we work with uh, you, uh, francophone entrepreneur, we put a lot of focus on thinking about how we can help them scale their business because that's not going to be the first focus. The first focus is going to be how I'm going to make sure that I'm going to get money because in the classic environment, they get money through the bank or they get money to uh, financing, which are uh, focusing on their capacity to generate cash. Uh, that will be for the francophone. When it And the other element that we see often also on the francophone is that uh, you have much more uh, single founder in the francophone than in the anglophone, so uh, that is also something that 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 we've that we've noticed. When you come to the anglophone, it's very different. They really are tinted by the uh, U.S. model. They think about how they're going to scale. They understand that there is huge market, so they will they will emphasize a lot in terms of we're going to scale, we're going to scale, we're going to scale, and they. And sometimes they forget to have uh, metrics that are adding up. You know, metrics that are generating values. Where basically, if you they they run very quickly out of money, then they basically are out of business. And in that case, that's where we, we're going to be focusing in in looking at okay, uh, what are your revenue streams? Uh, are your revenue streams are really working? Uh, what are how do what are the way that you can uh, increase your revenue stream, make them more efficient. So the approach is very different because, and that's and that's because of this uh, difference of culture and uh, which make that historically the, you know, uh, Francophone, the, you had more uh, SMEs and uh, yeah, um, equity and all this startup stuff are more Anglophone. So that's, um, that's what I can say about this difference. I don't know if that helps. It does. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot both for the, for the question and for the answer. Um, we also have a question from Susan in the um, in the chat, which is saying um, to pick up on Fadia's question. Um, so how does working with startups feed into the sustainability of a space? Um, have you pivoted to mainly working in this space or does it work in parallel and support other makerspace activities? Um, and I think this actually plays into um, a question I was wanting to come on to soon, which is um, about the funding of, of working with startups. And Rene, I wonder if you could just say a bit about, um, in response to Susan's question, but also about whether, um, basically where the funding comes from for the work that you do um, to support the entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you for that for that question. So it feeds into the sustainability of the space, but it, we didn't, it's not the only thing that we do. Mm -hmm. So um we've not pivoted to mainly work in that. It's a, it's definitely an add-on. I think it should, I mean, for us it does run right? parallel. We need both because it unlocks other things. So it's not, I don't think you can only look up. I don't think you're only going to be sustainable if you only work 
um, with startups and you're expecting to get the money that way, especially for, for the maker spaces and the type of work we do, because a lot of it is, is really still creating and, and you know, um, inventing and, you know, it's, it's really exploring, it's really explorative still. So um, sometimes it's not a real business model just yet, and that's still going to come. So you can't, not, I don't want to say you can't, maybe other spaces have managed to work that one out. But for us personally, you need both. You know, because it means our grant funding, because we also get grant funding. If we are not building people and we're not building capacity, then we won't have the pipeline because that's basically what we're building. We're building, you know, we're building the pipeline and getting into the support, the financial support for the startups is something that we did add on later, but it's something that we see can actually still grow. So we've restructured our organization to have different teams focusing on different things. So not everyone just works on, on one thing because we realized more and more that it actually needs to be a focus. And so you need to give the specific, you need to give the needed attention to that. And it, you need to be able to unlock further funding. So we do get grant funding and we have self-generated funding. And then we, of course, the money that we get back from the startups that we invested in, we try and keep in the same pool so that we are able to invest in other startups. So that doesn't really go to sustainability. It actually just goes to helping, helping more startups. And so we're always looking at innovative ways of generating other income. And again, for us, you know, um, just because we are organization and we're um, supporting startups doesn't mean that we can also create more startups, you know, and, and more innovation. So we're doing that all the time is creating, um, taking new ideas in different communities that we are in, different concepts. How do we pull it together? Is it sustainable? Can it actually generate money that can feed back into the organization? So it's not just the startups or our entrepreneurs that's on this journey as an organization. We are continually <laughs> reinventing ourselves as well. Yeah. Can I just ask briefly a, a bit more about the grant funding? So um, are you getting grant funding to run programs with entrepreneurs? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So part of it is for entrepreneurs. Others, it's other grant funding is really for the training that we give. So we don't only do, we don't only work with entrepreneurs, we actually have like a skills accelerator program, for instance, mm -hmm. where we do high impact um, digital skills, so coding and cloud computing and all of that. Um, and so we actually get funding to run that as well. And these are for 18 to 25 year olds. And again, this is the pipeline that we're building. So yeah. once they come through the program, you know, for, for many of them, the next phase is like, oh, okay, I can actually create something and I can come up with um, with an idea. So we do the, the building of people is not just entrepreneurs. It's actually general community members, whether it's young people or older individuals. Um, we actually run a training academy that just focuses on the needs of the community and what, they, what kind of training they're wanting at the moment. Great. Thank you. I want to add something to that. Uh... To that aspect because when it comes to uh, green tech capital green tech capital has been investing on the balance sheet so we we basically had a, a model that was quite similar to what ren is mentioning uh and uh some of the learning that i had from that time was that um it's very important to have an area of expertise because we see that a lot of uh make space that uh or because i think that green deck was not a make space but we had very specific uh expertise uh that we were providing systematically to the the the, the venture building so it's kind of a virtual i would say <laughs> virtual make space i would say and uh, and therefore uh we started to uh when we were doing a little bit of everything then finally when you're engaging with all those organizations that are providing grant and they have a very specific thematic, you know, you're not really matching. So I think that one of the first learning that we had was that we, we need to be more specific, uh, more specific, more data driven, because at any point of time, you need to provide information on your, your previous track record. And the other element I think as well is to understand in which value chain we are operating because, uh, you can you can have a, a value chain per sector, 
which will allow you also to gain expertise and to generate revenue for your activities. But you can also be in the value chain of investment. And this is where we see a lot of um, organizations that have specialized themselves by building pipeline for specific investors. So they, they understand the environment of investors, they understand what they're looking for, they understand the weakness of the company in that environment, and in doing that work to build those companies to make sure that they provide this pipeline to those investors who will pay for uh, help, helping them building pipeline. So um, I think that it's it's quite important to be able to answer those questions. What are our specificity? What are the, the, the specificity? Uh, what do we make uh, different? And to who we bringing values? Because at the end, if now the, 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 the answer is we bring value to entrepreneur, I think that it misses the point because the entrepreneur cannot pay. The fact is that by bringing value to an entrepreneur or certain profile of entrepreneur, you end up to bringing value to another stakeholders who I can actually can finance. And that is uh, some of the question I working with some uh, different organization. I think that this is what I've seen as the question that has been missed, you know, and say, okay, uh, yeah, we do that with entrepreneur a certain way because we are targeting. And the question is often because that's the same question we're asking to any entrepreneur. Who's your client? And and who's your client and who's benefiting from your services? And often it's not the same. And I think that for a lot of organizations, like what we, like we always had with Green Tank, sometimes we were mistaking who was a client and who was benefiting. And that mm -hmm. impacts definitely on your your sustainability. That's such an imp interesting and important point there. Um, have you then have you come across examples where um, maker spaces or innovation hubs or these type of sort of community spaces have been able to um, earn revenue effectively from investors for building their pipeline for them or to take a cut of in investment revenue or anything like that? Um, I think about. Uh, an example is quite known. Um, I think that this is what they did. I mean, like if you look at Founder Factory, mm -hmm. Founder Factory, that's what they did. They started by saying, okay, we're going to help, we, we're going to help entrepreneurs, we're going to structure, and now, you know, like they raise a huge amount of money because they position themselves into the, the, the value chain of the investment. And then uh, it was very logic to say, okay, we're going to provide you more because you're providing more quality. And then that's what they did. They, they, so I think that that's, that's an example. Um, I think that you have also, but sometimes integrate, if you look at uh, uh, Flat6 Lab, you know, Flat6 Lab, they, they kind of integrate also and connected with uh, investment organization. So there's a dynamic that's happening between the investment and uh, and um, uh, and the, the and the the, the, the maker space, and and I think that uh, I'm pretty sure that if you look in detail in term of some of the good clients of organization of uh, those uh, those kind of, of of structure, you will have some specific organizations like development agency that work systematically with. Uh, make a space because they they see that they um they solve some of the problem they provide them the the metrics they provide them the the, the informations that they need uh and they they generate the impact that they expected and they can structure the the reporting the way they want so um I think that there's several examples in um across the continent great thank you very much. Um, anything to add on that, Renee? I definitely agree. I, I definitely agree with Eric on on that one. I think that's one of the reasons we had to spin off our for profit arm purely um, to focus on the venture building because you we couldn't do it under the the non profit arm. Um, and then also the fund. You know, we have our labs fund, we have our labs ventures, so we have all these different entities that spun out of. The need you know each time you um but i definitely agree that you you can't you can't be everything to everyone but if you have a niche and you are able to to look at okay if it, if it can fit into each other and you're actually building a pipeline i think 
for us as one of the things that was helpful, it took a long time to, to get there because we always thought, you know, we just need um, one entity, you know, and we're able to do everything and, and we, we're not able to. And you need different individuals to run um, all of these different um, businesses because the rest of businesses, we only have the one for profit. So we definitely needed to bring in and specific expertise around that because the, the customers different when we get them in, into the nonprofit side when they're starting out, you know, it's a little different to when they're actually in the venture building stage. Um, and so, yeah, and so the way you, you treat them is actually different. So I definitely agree with Eric that you, you need to, at some point, um, get to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's a comment in the chat from Haima that I wanted to come to um, about um, needing guidelines. Uh, <laughs> Haima, I wonder if you could, could chime in and, and make that point. Um, yeah, I, this was, uh, I wrote it after, right after, uh, I think his name is Eric. He was talking about uh, investors and Africa-based uh, startups. So I was wondering if um, like the Africa-based uh, startups, in order for them to get investment from international investors, uh, should have different guidelines than, the, than other uh, startups that are based elsewhere. Um, um, well, I, uh, so I think that the, first of all, to get investment from an investors, you need to have your entity need to be in a, uh, legal environment was matching the request or the specificity of the investors targeting. So, um, I think that when you have, um, investor, uh, a startup that are not in Africa, which are in Europe. You know, which are in the U.S., the, the ecosystem is so mature that uh, people will feel very comfortable with the jurisdictions of where they're operating. So that that makes things much more easier. When you have a startup which is uh, in Africa, uh, then of course there's other questions that come to the investors: Cap capital appropriations, uh, uh, the 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 governance, all the all different aspects that are coming into play. That's why you see, for example, uh, most of the the startup um, in Anglophone countries they go into the Delaware because that's and because they're targeting a lot of U.S. investors. Uh, some investors, some companies in some startup in the Francophone will go to France or uh, very little to Luxembourg because it's too expensive. But basically, everybody's trying to find an environment that make the investor the investor much more comfortable. Um, um, in that uh, in that regard, so I think that for the for the startup, I think at some point when you want to scale, you need to know where your investors are and where they feel comfortable to to put their money uh, to put the money. In. And the other thing is that the most important thing for investors, uh, and it's even more important for African company, is the communications. You know, uh, people always say. When it goes goes well, communicate. When it goes bad, communicate even even more. And and I think that that's uh, that is even more relevant for African uh, entrepreneur because you have to imagine that somebody uh, uh, wire you money from abroad um, at some point doesn't know what's happening, etc. And you know he build movies in his head. It doesn't make things better. So. I think that that's that it's even more concerning for uh, African founder because the perception risk in the African market is uh, is pretty high, and um, and um, therefore we will, uh, as African we don't have the same uh, condition and the same view uh, from the then uh, um, uh, European founders and uh, European founders. Um, uh, operating uh, operating in Europe. And that's also why we've seen for years this debate, this is a big question in terms of uh, why all the money is going to uh, 
uh, foreigners when it comes to Africa, like European founders or US um, uh, founders and not so much to African founders. Um, it's just because there's the, this feeling of proximity is totally different. And I think that African founders need to be aware, conscious about it, and they need to act on it. Thanks for, for sharing that, Eric. Um, I think we're, um, sorry, I was just reading Jaime's response. So she's just thanking you for the um, very, very thorough response. Um, um, I think we're, we're coming to an end. I'd like to ask um, Rene and Eric, if either of you have any, any final thoughts that you'd like to share um, or anything that you want to uh, leave people with or, or to summarize. Really? <laughs> okay, I'll go. Thank you so much, Tim. You know, thank you for, for today. I think the conversations are, are always good and we need to have more of that because, you know, the information needs to be shared. It needs to be filtered down. I'm happy that there's a YouTube um, link that's going to be there that can be replayed and we can share with our entrepreneurs because there's not enough information. Um, and, you know, a lot of it comes from from the US or from Europe, but again, it might not be applicable to, to the continent. So I'm really happy um, for this. And I think it's, it's quite insightful, but it also scares me a little bit because it shows that we still have so much work to do. You know, we, you know, if everyone is, is driving and, you know, starting initiatives and doing things, but I think we're not aligning it enough. You know, I think that there's still so many things happening, especially on our continent, that's in isolation. And amazing, great, great initiatives, but we need to be bringing them closer together or collaborating more. I don't know. I don't have the exact words or framework of how it should work, but there's still so much work to do. Our, our entrepreneurs are there. The innovators are there. We know, we know that. Um, the investors are there, even on the continent, because I think that was a really important point that was raised, is that we, we, we don't need the same kind of investors. We need a different kind of investor. And we don't have to look very far. They are on the continent, right? because they understand the need and they understand the ecosystem the best. And so even how do we unlock that even more, you know, so that we're not only relying on Europe and the US to be sending money to, to Africa to, for our entrepreneurs, because of course, if it comes here, the exchange rate changes and we then need to pay it back. We all know what happens with the exchange rate and how terrible that is for, for our startups. And so, you know, there are different things that we can do, but definitely looking at, um, there's still so much more. There's more. We need, we, need to be, we need to be doing more and we need to be talking more. And we need to have more conversations and more dialogues and making sure that our entrepreneurs are included and that our investors are included because it's, we don't just want to be doing the work on one level and not on the other. So even for the investors, maybe they don't know that there are different types of entrepreneurs and there are different mechanisms of actually giving investment, you know, and, and doing that on the, on the continent. So there's definitely more things we can do. So I'm going to be very optimistic and say that, you know, it's not all bleak. We, we, we will definitely get there. Thank you. I think that's a, a great note to end on. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. Um, Eric, any any final thoughts from your side? If you'd like, anything yeah, you'd like to yeah. comment on? Yeah, I think that it, uh, it's quite interesting that um, there is this kind of debate in terms of the sustainability of the of uh, the stakeholders of the ecosystem uh, mm -hmm. because the, the organizations like MakeSpace are supporting the ecosystems. And uh, at some point, I think that the question of sustainability um, is very critical and the question of knowledge sharing is very critical. Uh, knowledge sharing because the ecosystem is pretty new and that you have so much gap into different organizations and so which makes that uh it's it's very difficult then to for after that for a uh, company to scale regionally because they will go from an environment where they have the talent they have the infrastructure to an environment where there is nothing and and even if that's a potential market that stop and i think that that will contribute to help uh company grow 
that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, I think it's also pretty important for the uh, the sustainability of the organization because uh, uh, a lot of organizations are depending from development organizations who are depending from a ministerial uh, strategy and, and program which are changing maybe every two or three years, which means that you, you're going to have organizations that are going to be operating, maybe being efficient. They will get access to some financing because they're matching with the thematic at the moment. But after a certain period, there's no more funding allocated on the thematic. And even if they're performing, they'll be dying. So I think that there's a necessity for that ecosystem to think in terms of other way to generate revenues to ensure the sustainability and get a little bit more independency from, uh, you know, a grant uh, model. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's uh, the, the same way we apply to a startup and we say to a startup, don't base your business on grant because maybe one day you won't have more. I think that for um, uh, support organizations, I think it's also as well important to to underline this aspect and and uh, and push organizations to talk with others, see what are the models that are implemented and see how they can generate revenue to be sustainable by themselves. So I think that's a great initiative to to drive that message forward. I really appreciate you saying that, Eric. I couldn't have asked for a better lead into what I was about to say. Um, so through the make project um we've been able to do quite a bit of work at, at collecting some of these models that um that maker spaces and hubs are using to sustain themselves as important players in the ecosystem and we've now launched a website called localeconomies.org i've just put the url in the chat um which shares that information um it, we are going to continue to build on it and so we would love to um, have any feedback on on the information that's there and how it can be made better and more useful um, I'll also will when these when this video goes up on YouTube, link to it from the appropriate um, place on the site. There is a, a model about startup support. Um, and if you're interested to, to follow the developments on that site, then there is a, a mailing list that you can sign up for at that address. So I think we've come to the end of today. And thank you so much, Eric and Rene, both of you for your time and for your insights, um, for sharing your expertise with us. It's been a um, really fascinating conversation for, from my perspective. And I have certainly gathered that also from the um, reactions and questions that we've had. I think everyone has found that. And this is, of course, the last one now in this, this series of conversations that we've been having over the year. Um, so, Fadia, I see you've raised your hand. Um, I will ask you to, to jump in now in your uh, coordinator of gig role, please. But from my perspective, thank you to our speakers and thank you to, to our participants and to everybody who's taken part in this series. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's such a great moment to see us come this far, to be honest. It's uh, more than eight episodes. I guess this is the ninth episode, right, Anna? And it's been full with so many inspiring people and so many inspiring conversations. Um, I actually would love to end by thanking you, Anna, for taking um, and, and taking it and doing such a great job uh this year creating everything and as you said um this has not just been a series but also anna worked with the team on producing a, an open catalog that is published so i personally feel very moved to have worked with you on this and i just love to say that the discussions has been very very inspiring um so yeah thank you so much i think it's a round of applause well deserved for anna and i hand thank over to you <laughs> Thank you very much. So just the, the very final thing I would say is that um, that on the gig WhatsApp group, there is now a channel called Business and Sustainability, and that we're going to be continuing discussions on there and also talking about, you know, so this series has come to an end, but what might be next? Um, and, you know, so we'd love to hear from people what else you'd love to hear, what you'd like to hear about. And um I'll just thank our speakers from today one more time for such an interesting discussion. Rene, Eric, very thank much you. appreciated. Thank you for the Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.